It's good to see everyone here this morning. We're in our study of the institution that God instituted. It's called the what? We've been studying. It's the church. Last week we described it and defined it, the terms, and we looked at the definition and saw that our English word church comes from what word? Well, that's where we'll get to, but if we wanted to see where our English word came from, it would not be ecclesia. It'd be another Greek term denoting Lord. Is there a sense that the church could be, could be connected with Lord? Well, the old English would connect it with the Lord's house. Can you see why people would think church is kind of a building? <laughs> it's the Lord's house. But you're right that we get our word in the New Testament. That's why we study the New Testament to see as we study the church that word is ecclesia. What does that mean? We put two parts together. What is it? The called out. Ek meaning out. Kaleo meaning the, the call. And how descriptive is that? And we looked at our text and saw it at, that in 1 Peter 2, 9, for example, we've been called out of darkness. We can look at 2 Thessalonians. What were we called by? What are we called by? The gospel, the good news. And so we're sitting here trying to teach people about the church, which if we're going to save people to Christ, we're going to have to have that study. And if we can be fair with their, well, they look up the definition of church and may look at Old English, and you need to understand that's where they may go first. And you can try to explain it. But now we saw that even the word ecclesia is used three times in the New Testament to denote just a secular assembly. Two times it's a mob, and one time it's a regular assembly to make judgments. Had nothing to do with the church. But is it not descriptive? It was an assembly. It was people called for a purpose. It was people called out, separated from the public. It's a mob or it's a regular assembly making decisions. From that point of view, from that definition, we begin to understand the church fits that very well. That is the body of people, an assembly of people called out by the gospel. We talked about that last time. So this morning, we want to begin and our study about the universal and the local church. And under part two of our outline, you have some details that we can look at that show that there's a difference. And the, and the New Testament speaks of the church in those two areas. There's a third area that we would say it's not universal, it's not local, it's distributive. And I'm not going to bring that in this study, but you'll find fear came on the whole church in Acts 5.11. Was that the local church? Was that the universal church? Does the local church have fear? It's talking about the individuals that made up the entire body of Christ in that area and wherever it was going to be told. It would come in the hearts of people. Glorify God in the church. How do we do that? We glorify God in our bodies, that we are members of the church. And we speak about that sometimes in the distributive sense. I'm not including that in this lesson, but to get into details, it's good to go through. What does he mean by it? How did, how did uh, just a called out body fear, uh, unless it's dealing with the individuals that heard that and they were members of, of the church, that uh, we could fit that. But sometimes it's used in that sense. But we're looking at the universal idea. So when Jesus says, in Matthew 16 and verse 18, I will build my church. Was he speaking about a local church? Or was he speaking about the church in its universal sense? That's right. And one way we can see, well, there's got to be a distinction because in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ, plural, churches of Christ salute you. I thought Jesus came to build one church. He did. But what were those churches of Christ? Were they universal churches? Fighting for territory, or were they local churches? They were local. So we, we realize that, that distinction that is there. Under the universal church, we will see in uh, A2, 2A2, the Lord adds members to the church. Is that the universal church? Yes. We'll see in Matthew 9 and verse 26 that Paul wants to join himself to a local church in Jerusalem. We'll talk about that in a moment. 
But the Lord doesn't add you to the lo local church. And we need to, when we're teaching people, it's, a, it's the general body of those who are saved. And they're made up of saints, Galatians 3, 27. When we're baptized into that one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, there's the universal uh, nature of the church. We, then the, then we, are, we put on Christ. We belong to Him. We'll be sanctified, set apart unto Him. So that's in the universal church that's true. Those saints will be located They'll be grouped in Jerusalem, Ephesus, and places like that. But when we're, we're just speaking, it's comprised of that. They assemble figuratively. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, for example, we've, we've come to Mount Zion. As he describes this, this assembly as if we were all here. Look who's all here. The church of the firstborn, that's plural, meaning firstborn ones. That's not Jesus, that's us that make up that. The firstborn ones who are, where's our enrollment? Heaven. I didn't go up there literally, did you? If you did, let me know. You got something I don't, I don't have. What was it like? We're, we're, it's it's the, the picture, imagery of where firstborn, we're enrolled in heaven, not enrolled in Austin or anywhere like that, or in Washington, D.C. And to God, the judge of all, we're, uh, we're, we're literally before the presence of God. Figured he said, we're judge, he's a judge of all, and to spirit those who have gone on, for there we would call them their reward. They're still um, members of his universal church, but it's as if a figurative assembly, but it's still the concept of that church that called out. Here's God, <coughs> here's the angels, here's this kingdom that is set up that's spiritual in nature, and it's the church made up of ones that are very special to God, firstborn ones that uh, they, they have that, that's talking about you and me as individuals that make up that church in its universal sense. People in Africa, people here, people in Europe, we are in that one body. But, the, but we also realize that the relationship of individual with saints can be local. And God has designed that way, I think, for a lot of reasons. And I think especially in times when we have to be isolated in our communities. Local church becomes very very important. We're not floating around all the time. Well, we shouldn't be. We need to be dedicated to a, a local church. And as we see, that's what we see. Why did Apostle Paul uh, want to do that? But he did that. And notice in part B, it's by agreement with fellow saints in 3 John 10. Well, I, I don't the Baptist agree before you can be baptized to join the Baptist church? Do they have to listen to your testimony? What's our argument? That's not to get into the universal church. We're baptized to get into the universal church. But here in 3 John 10, one person can kick you out of the local church. Is that what Dr. Fees was doing? I did, well, it's not right. I didn't say it's right. Did he do it? And it was causing problems with, with Apostle John. He said, therefore, verse 10, if I come, I will bring to remembrance the works which he doeth, prating against us with wicked words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren. Those are people coming with the authority of God behind it. God accepts them in the universal church, but we're looking at a locality. Neither doth himself receive the brethren, and them that would he forbiddeth, and casteth them out of the church. They didn't say that was his intent. He stood up and forbade that, and they were not able to be in that church. Universal church? You didn't have control over that, but you can control locality by those who are seeking to be a diatrophies. And that's not something that is pleasing. That's something that's damning to people like diatrophies. And so, here again, they're not even accepting the testimony of the apostles. They're rejecting the Word of God that the apostles revealed. And they, if you agree with John, you're out. You're out. And apparently, he had that influence and power to do that. That's affecting the local church. Certain saints are located. I didn't say every saint was there, 
But what are the saints? 1 Corinthians 1, 2. The saints, what does the word saint mean? Set apart. Uh, separating something holy from that which is common. Set apart uh, unto God. They're, they're saints. They're sanctified by the blood of Christ. So we see that connection of baptism brought into that one body, the universal church. But there are certain saints located there. The church of God, which is where? Corinth. That are saints. And they, 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 they're in fellowship with God. But that is a local. Uh, then we set up a figurative assembly because it is in a locality where we can physically be together. There is indeed a literal assembly of God's people. And I use the example in 1 Corinthians 14th chapter. Not only are saints there, but unbelievers have assembled as well. They're coming to see what is happening. And Paul says, if I speak in tongues, meaning in languages that those people don't understand, they're going to come in and they're going to think we're mad. We're out of our minds. We are crazy. Because they don't understand what, what we are saying. But if he speaks as a prophet, would speak in the language of the people you're teaching, Therefore, because that whole chapter is dealing with understanding and knowledge, that indeed they'll be convicted to their heart because they'll realize God is indeed, you of, is indeed among you because here were inspired prophets able to know what's in what you're thinking about, what maybe your past has been, things about you. And it would confirm that this is a messenger from God and they say God is among you. That's constructive. But how do you do that figuratively, where some are in heaven, some here? You know, that's figurative. Here is the assembly. And it was a place where they didn't have the Word of God completed. They would sing hymns, inspired hymns. They would be making inspired prayers. And they would be teaching inspired messages to build up, to edify that local body of people. And all of the Local churches are involved in, in doing that. Can Satan prevail against the local church? I think it was brought up last week that, you, you know, you can't prevail against the church. Well, you can local church. But remember, they made the point that it's, we're dealing with a universal church. That's not the, you can't, you can't do that. Because God determines who's in his church, not man. And so we see in Revelation 2, 5, are we in a local setting? The church, where? In Revelation 2, as it opens up. Ephesus, that's a local church. And they had left their first love. They did a lot of things right. Oh, they were, they were testing the prophets and finding them false. Why? Because they had an inspired standard of truth. It wasn't, I just don't think you're doing right. No, you are contradicting the teachings of God, and they were able to prove and manifest that they were false prophets. They were false people claiming who they, they were. But he says, you've left your first love. I believe. He said, well, here they're doing all the testing, and, and that's pleasing to God. But they forgot why they do it. It was all about me. We're doing this. We're, you're a false teacher. We're, we're, we're making that. You forgot what, what, where is that supposed to be coming from? Love. I don't think they were not loving each other. That may come, but it's just kind of like we're an empty suit. Boy, look at us. We're active. We're, we're, doing, we're doing this and we're doing that. We're, we're casting out the false teachers. And they forgot the motive. Loving God. He says, you need to repent and need to turn or else what is God going to do? What is the Lord going to do? Yeah. Did they have a little candlestick? No, I think we're dealing with, this is, you're supposed to be a light barrier of me. And if you're not having the love for me of why you do things, I will take that candlestick. What does that mean? You're not going to be bearing light for me. And what he, devil can prevail. Just like the devil can cause people in the Old Testament be accursed. They couldn't do it by the prophet Balaam. They tried. He tried. But they got them to sin against God. And God destroyed them. Why was, uh, how was Daniel going to be caught? And how are we going to take down Daniel? 
get him to contradict the teachings of God. And God will bring the judgment upon, upon him. And that's the way they, they looked at that. And, of course, God overcomes that with them. But there's, that, there's this picture. Satan can prevail. In fact, he can destroy a church that it no longer is effective and maybe no longer exists. But you can't touch the universal body of Christ. Because what did Jesus say? What was Jesus saying? Upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of what will not prevail against it? It's not Gehenna, it's Hades, denoting the grave. Death is not going to overcome that. It's, it's, a, it's an eternal uh, relationship, it's an eternal kingdom that will not be shaken. We see people still part of that kingdom that's enrolled in, not only enrolled in heaven, but they're made perfect now. They've left this life. They're in a saved relationship. And that relationship is with God. But one day that kingdom will be turned back to God. And God will determine who's in it and who's not. And so, Satan, you can't prevail against this church. You can cause one to leave the face of the earth in Ephesus. And every locality, you can do that by people not following the things of God. But you can't prevail against uh, the universal church. So here's my question. Join the church of your choice. Now we're getting down. We've got some knowledge now. And now we face the people who have seen this in advertisements when they read newspapers. They may see it online now. That here it's just open. You just need to go to church. And you need just... Join the church of your choice. How do you respond to that? i tell you how we respond to it. You don't have a choice in the church. It didn't say join the church. The Lord adds you to the church. Next statement. Wait a minute. You know in the back of your mind that Paul joined himself to a local church. So don't cloud it that that's there and there's a joining of a church. Now you may want to argue, we don't have a choice in churches. There's only one church. There's some choices, localities, and we may take it a step further. Well, they're not living right, this and that. You can go into that arrangement. But the idea, well, you don't join the church. The Lord adds you to the church. I've heard that over and over again. And there's some truth to that. But there's some falsehood to it, too. There's incompleteness. It sounds good, and we move on, because we told them off. But did we teach them anything? And the basic understanding or misunderstanding is that we have church used in two senses here. When you come to be a member at Parkview, you just step in, I'm a member? What the elders do. They won't know your background. Some have offended in that. Today, people don't even ask when church people leave here. They don't even ask about, about them. And you know, we, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. But there's got to be an agreement locally. So when the Baptists say that, you know, you've got to realize, no, that's, you're, you're speaking about universal church. We're baptized into that church when we hear the gospel, not on your vote, but in a locality. We're going to work together in locality. That's something that you join yourself to those people. Now, was there a problem with Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, in joining himself to, to the church in Jerusalem? Big time. Why? Jerusalem? What had he done? Persecuted them, and they knew that. And, but Barnabas comes in and says, well, he saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. He's gone and preached in Damascus already in the Lord. And he wants to join the saints here in Jerusalem. And because he could give confirmation information, they agreed. And so he was among them going in, going out and coming in. 
He was a member. As he went out, he was a member of Jerusalem. He was a member among them. That was kind of a, his place where he stayed and, and was working, but he was, he was traveling. But he was among them, coming in and coming out, especially at that particular point that we see. And so there, there's an example of why it's important to join yourself to a local church. I don't have a problem. You shouldn't use this word join. Yeah, I should. It's what the Bible says. I need to be able to explain if that come, comes in. And what I want to emphasize, the Lord adds this to the universal church, but you're going to have to decide which local church in the area you're going to join yourself to. Is that too difficult? But if we just automatically say, you don't join the church, the Lord adds you to the church, we're shortcutting things. And maybe someone doesn't understand that. And what are you going to say to me when I've been reading the book of Acts 2 because I wanted to prepare for your study, you wanted to teach me the gospel. How about that? At least you'll know maybe what to say. And realize there again is this basic concept of what we need to have about the difference between the local and the universal church. Any questions or comments you'd like to add to that? Yes, sir. Yeah. And that's going to be, and then when you get churches in the area, you say the problem is your, I'm going to have to choose one in this area to go to because I have what? Choices. And so I've been that area, but I, I can't, can I pick the one that I like? Well, it's got to be according to standard and, and that we'll have to do that. And if we're in, and if it's anywhere churches are not following the teachings of God, <clears throat> It's a judgment call what you want to do at that time with their knowledge. But uh, that's true. But th that becomes, it's not tidy, but at least be prepared before going in. This is something I might need to emphasize. And if we just stop with you don't join the church, the Lord adds you to the church, I, I think that's a little surface stuff. And in reality, it's half truth. <laughs> really, it's a half truth. And there's a lot of and, and idea of choosing the, which church we want to, uh, and they're thinking about denominationalism. Uh, we've got to, we, you and I have to deal with that. But back then, they didn't have those choices, did they? They, they didn't have uh, that other than, uh, hey, I want to be with you people in Jerusalem. There may, as far as I know, there's not a, another local church there. I've got to be here or I want to be with God's people. And uh, it was so important to, uh, to Paul. So that's, that's, a good, that's a good point. All right. We speak about the church universal. We look at the part of that. How many how many bodies It's a church is a body. How many bodies are there? Ephesians 4 says there's one body and so forth. And we'll talk more about unity in a moment. Who is the head of that body? We're trying to teach someone. We don't have to go to another book right now. We can go to just across the page, back page or two. Uh, what, one head, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 is a passage. He gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. There's a, there's a, a spiritual connection, analogy that's taking place with the church and the, and the body, the physical body. Uh, and we're, we are indeed members of that. And it is in, in the context of Ephesians 4, it is a foundation for unity, not division. And yet, in the church, we see what does the very word denomination imply? Well, multiple. There are many, but they're divided. De divide, denomination. What, what denominations of our currency are you giving me? I'm giving you five. Well, I want a ten. Uh, it's division. And <coughs> we see that when you went one, you're trying to say you have unity? Yeah, because why? There's only one. And therefore, we can be united. Just like there's one God, so I can love him with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. I don't, I don't have to divide myself. There's only one God. And so we see there's one body, one spirit, one hope, and so forth. Now, here's my, here's my question. What barriers exist keeping one from thinking 
the only members of the church of Christ are going to heaven. Notice what I said. First of all, do you accept that quotation? Do you believe that? We may have some that don't. I'm not speaking about, well, there's Old Testament people. They're going to be saved. They weren't members of the church, hadn't been established yet. But when we look at today, when we know what the Bible is saying, is that statement true or is that just prejudice? Church of Christ, folks. What? And, and a third lesson, we're going to talk about the name. And you say, well, why well, have a whole lesson? It's because we'll, we'll deal with that, that concept of name and what it expresses and so forth. But that's true. And, and there's going to have to be some bar there's a barrier there. Because when someone makes that statement, only the members of the Church of Christ, I'm not saying you make that statement, but what do people believe about us? So we hope they never ask that because I'm going to back off that and say, well, there's other people in other churches that are going to heaven. Really? What authority do you have for that? We don't. But it is so wonderful when you find out that we may be a church of Christ and all of us are going to hell. Just because we're members here doesn't mean we're going to be saved. It's going to be as God kept us in fellowship with him. Have we kept our fellowship with God? And that's got a standard to follow. And one day... There's going to be that discussion. But that, to me, that's a barrier we face. So what do people do? Let's change our name. Let's change our name. And we're going to teach people the gospel. And when you teach people the gospel, you'll realize what that answer is. And so that's a barrier. And my question, how do you cast down those barriers to establish scriptural truth? And this is where we can think, how would you approach that? I tell you what I've done in gospel meetings, because, see, we have an assembly of people. And sometimes I've preached in churches that just have two sections, not a third one. But if I were to say to this people that, indeed, you're the only ones that are in this building, how would the rest of you feel? Besides being sympathetic for a guy that's ignorant and blind and crazy. What if I said that to these people over here? Did y'all feel pretty good? Yeah, we're here. Thank you for recognizing us. How would you feel? Why? Because you believe you're in this assembly. Why not let, so you're sitting with a couple or you're maybe sitting with an individual and uh, it may be a difficult thing, but you see, you're with other people. You could just divide it up because that, that would be insensitive. Don't you know we're here? That's right. And so you begin there to start painting the picture of who's really there. And there's only one place. Of course, we're individuals making up this assembly. So we're not trying to leave anybody out. But we then began to realize, I know where you're coming from. But I want you to listen to me. I've got about four or five points to make with you that when I get through, you'll understand where I am coming from. Isn't that a fair discussion? Let's start with the word ecclesia. What does it mean? We're called out. I've got 1 Peter 2. And I said, we're called out of darkness. Why don't I just add one more passage to that? What do you mean called out of darkness? Well, we, that's sin. wonder if I say you were called out of the uh, power of sin, the rule of sin. I all of a sudden have opened up the discussion for a kingdom. And Colossians 1 and verse 13, who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. 
Now I've got the church connected with the kingdom, kingdom connected with the church. I'm establishing a relationship, an analogy that will be helpful down the future. But with one additional passage to the point of ecclesia means called out people. And I've been called out of what? And my question is, can I be saved while remaining in darkness? What's the answer? Can I be saved and never come to light? Can I be saved and still be in the darkness of sin, under the power of sin? Who, what do you think your person you're trying to teach, what do you think they'd say? I've never had anybody disagree with me. I said, no. You can't be sa well, saved from what? That's darkness is sin. And so we've been called out of the dark. No, we're called out of the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom. That's why he, see, he speaks about kingdom, rule, power, context. And he speaks about that. And now I'm in the kingdom, not a kingdom, not a bunch of kingdoms. I'm in a kingdom that belongs to Christ. I'm going to be close. What's the church that belongs to Christ? We'll be able to make those connections, but you've got to fill, build a basis. And so now you have the word ecclesia. So you were called out of something and it's darkness. Either you're in the darkness or you're in the light when it comes to being saved. And that's a concept we have to have. Say, well, I'm not real good. I'm not real bad. And, and God's going to love me enough to get me in. Okay. What's your basis for that? What's the, the, what's the scriptural basis for that? But I think most people said, no, I understand. And we don't have a lot of time to develop this, but is that where the saved are? We'll just jump to that one. If we lose our time, but here you, he just got that a darkness sin, and what have been, we've been called out by the gospel. We, we've, we've already established that. So I've got three or four passages to kind of take down that barrier that realize I need, to, I need to be in the church. Not that the church saves me, but what did we see in Acts 2.47 last week? According to the King James translation, the Lord added to the church daily such as were being what? Saved. And what does Paul say in Ephesians 5.23? He said, Jesus is the Savior of the what? Body. And we've already established in Ephesians 1.22 and 23 that the body is the church. Where are the saved? It's in the church. They're no longer in darkness. They're in a kingdom of light. And I ask, where do you find in Scripture someone in between? Half saved, half lost? You're dealing, that's why the, the, the epistle of John is so instructive. Because he won't allow you any gray areas. Didn't mean there's not gray areas. Just like how we're going to define the choice. <laughs> there's some areas we're going to have to, to, to flush out for people. And to, and to open up the skies a little bit. Realize where we're coming from. But there's, there's one area that you could come to. All right. Relationship. Church is a relationship. Either you're a son of God or you're the son of the devil. I can establish that. There's no in between from God's perspective. In 1 John, the third chapter, in verse 10, we read where Jesus, or John, the inspired apostle, says, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness, you didn't come from God. You're not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Thank you. And so, verse, verse 8, to this end was the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever begotten of God doeth no sin. Because his seed abideth in him, he cannot sin because he's begotten of God. Meaning, doesn't mean he can't sin after becoming a Christian, but he doesn't continue in sin. Because if I continue in sin, I remain in darkness. Who's my father? The devil. <laughs> well, I don't want that. I don't want you to be that way either. 
Only those who do are indeed going to follow the ways of righteousness. And how do we determine what's righteous? Romans 1, 16 and 17, the gospel is the power to save, for therein is revealed the righteousness of God. You want to be righteous? Let's study what the New Testament says to be righteous. And it won't be personal righteousness. It'll be the humility to put ourselves under God, confess who Jesus is, repent of our sins, be baptized for the mission of our sins and submit to him. But we're working at two areas of thought and there's no in between. And can the son of the devil be saved? No. Where are the sons of God? Where are the children of God? They're following righteous. And where are the saved? The Lord put the saved in his church. When we obeyed that gospel, we're baptized into one body. That's not the local church, that's the universal church. And we begin to realize, well, relationship was God and the devil, darkness and light we have there. There could be a, a, a number of, of analogies we might be able to make that, that deal with that. Our, and just from the word of ecclesia and you're tearing down the barrier. That's, we're, we're, we're to strike down those things or imaginations against God. And the only way to know that constructively is to help people see we're not being proud and arrogant and judgmental when we say that only the members of the church of Christ are going to heaven. There's some of us that may not make it just because we're members of the church. But that's where the Lord placed the saved. He's the savior of how many bodies? Is this, they're just one body. Now, to understand the idea of the church, I want to, what denominationalism, now let's look at it from their standpoint. Why they would be so upset, just like you would if I said y'all not here and they're the only ones here. I need to know where you're coming from. And some of you in that aisle, some of you are here. Are we in the building together? Here's where they're coming from. Here's that big circle. That's the building. But you're in a middle aisle, Baptist Church, Episcopalian. You're in a, another aisle, Catholic and Methodist. I don't know if you get those together, but that's, there's the division. And the church universal is made up of denominations. Baptists, Catholics, Presbyterians, and Church of Christ, what's in the mind of the people today? Are we just a denomination? You better realize it. Yes, we are. And we have to have, we know we're not, we don't want to be a denomination. We want to be that church that we read about here. That's why we're studying that. And that's the church that we want to belong to. There's only one. And if you can help me find that one, good. I'm going to try to help you find it. Maybe together we can figure it out. But it'll be from this, and that's where we're going. And so there's the concept. So what do you, what's the first thing you need to do? It, knowing where they're coming from, why they would be upset with, well, only the church of Christ is going to heaven. Wonder if uh, they're just one aisle. <laughs> they're just one section. We, we, no, we're all here equal. And anybody that obeys the gospel can be a part of that church. So how would you go about doing that from a scriptural point of view? What is the church universal made up of? Individual saints. All right. Let's see if I can do that in a one passage that will, it will help us see that. And we're speaking about the church in its universal sense because there are a lot of local churches. But there's only one universal church and it's not made up of denominations. Where do you read a denomination in the New Testament? They're not there. They didn't come later. And we'll, we'll inject that into our study as we go. But, but I'm going to close with this one. Look, turn to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and our, our time will be up. We've established for in one spirit or for, for in one spirit you were baptized in one body. So in one spirit that delivered the gospel, 
I received that gospel, so that I was baptized. I was baptized into how many bodies? One body. So I got the one body, I got the one spirit teaching the gospel that calls me out as being the church. Now listen to this. Whether Methodist or Baptist, is that what it says? What does it say? Jews or Greeks? Whether Episcopalians or holiness. What is it? Whether bond or free. Who is he speaking about there? Individuals. Regardless their race, Jew or Greek. Regardless of their social standing, bond, slaves, or free. What are we? We're all made to drink of one spirit. So the individuals make up the church universal. That's the conversation you're going to have to have because you know where they're coming from and you're not judgmental. I would understand why they would be upset with that question. Just like you'd be upset when you're not included in my assembly. But you're here. And we'll have to stop there. We'll, we'll uh, pick up on that and lesson two is back there for you to, to study as well. Thank you.